Hey, I just want to thank you for being a part of the conversation. Let's do some pod crashing. Episode number 328 is with Caroline Cole and Rebecca Mellinger from the podcast Trapped in Treatment. We're great. How are you doing? Absolutely fantastic. I knew last year when you and I talked, the, the three of us, that we were going to do this again. And, and I, I'm just so glad and so proud of you for, for going on with season two of Trapped in Treatment. Thank, thank you. you. We're so excited to be back and and share more about what we've learned and and the state of the troubled teen industry today. Well, one of the things that the two of you keep bringing up, and and that is, and it's becoming a part of the conversation, is you're making us aware of situations. For for instance, like these people who who prey upon parents saying they can help their babies. I see this more than just in institutions. I see this in in martial arts schools. I see it in all these things where, oh, we can make your your child stronger, and, and they get trapped into doing these things absolutely i mean that pervasiveness of kind of manipulation in a sense can impact so many different people i mean not just the troubled teen industry but you take you know long-term adult care and there are so many different ways that you know systemic institutional abuse can relate to families and we always like to say that you know the troubled teen industry can impact every single community in our nation. And it really is the case because they're preying on vulnerable families during a time of need, you know, and and getting kids into their care. Yeah. Provo Canyon School. This can't be the only one in this nation. There are actually thousands of facilities just like Provo Canyon School. And that's something that we cover in Trapped in Treatment is really we wanted to do an analysis of kind of the history, right? How did this industry get started? Yep. Who were the major players? Um, and, and what are the stories of real people who were there? Um, and, and how has it gone on to impact their lives? And so in, in season two, we've extended that journey with an organization called WASP. And WASP actually... Uh, uh, its creator started at Provo Canyon School, and then he went on to open over 26 different programs across the world, as mm. far as Samoa to the Czech Republic to Mexico and all throughout the United States. I can't imagine sitting in a room with you during a meeting of each one of these podcasts, because when you start uncovering the truth, the two of you looking at each other and with your directors and producers and coming up with how are we going to make this into a podcast where we can keep the attention of listeners? I mean, it's got to be so dynamic. It is. I mean, the stories are really, really shocking. And we're obviously embedded into these stories and, and hearing these, you know, every single day as we work through to create, you know, a piece of investigative journalism and entertainment, but also as we push for policy change. So not only are, you know, the folks that are willing to share their stories on Trapped in Treatment and through all of our media opportunities sharing their story, but they're also working alongside us at the capitals where they're able to share their stories with the hopes that we can, you know, promote change, whether that be state or federal policy change, or introducing them to legal assistance so that they can seek justice that way. Um, Like we said, you know, there are facilities in every single state. In North Carolina, there was just a child who unfortunately died. He Mm -hmm. was 12. Mm -hmm. He had been transported from New York that day. And that night, he was placed in a restraining device where I believe he, you know, ended up not being able to breathe um, and he had had a mental health crisis overnight and when you know he woke up that morning after not being checked on for many many hours he was found dead and Mm. so I mean can you imagine a family who is trying to do the best that they can for their child and then they get a call that they died in these facilities at the hands of these operators and so you know we really want to use these personal stories and these allegations to not only tell them and create entertainment out of it, but to really impact change that no more children are trapped in treatment, are abused in treatment, or die in the name of treatment. You're starting the conversation. That's the thing about it. And and landing these conversations is a big thing. And and one, one of the things I love about the two of you is the fact that you're not just podcasters, you're activators. You want those policies to be changed. You're physically getting involved in this. We are. It's a daily effort um, at 1111 Media Impact, which is the organization that 
Paris, Caroline and I run, you know, we are taking these stories. We're looking at the landscape of, you know, the regulatory structure and the licensing structure across every single state. We're looking at where children are being sent from, which states have more facilities than others and investigating why that is. And then we're looking at, you know, how can we increase protections for children in these facilities? How can we make sure that the licensing offices in every single state are doing their due diligence and are checking on these facilities and asking the right questions so that we can end up getting to the bottom of what really needs to be solved. And so we are at the helm of that. And we always recommend that those with lived experience are the ones promoting change because who knows it best than those that have lived it. When you hear the name Robert Litchfield, I can't imagine what goes through your imagination immediately. Um, I personally feel somewhat sick to my stomach yep. when I hear yeah. that name. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this, this is the guy who actually owned the program that I went to when I was a teenager. And I was at that program for uh, 29 months. And during that time was not allowed to talk was not allowed to move, was not allowed to get up and go get a book off the bookshelf. And so my every single movement for two and a half years was absolutely under the highest scrutiny and control. And, uh, you know, let me just tell you firsthand that will do something to you Mm -hmm. over time. And so um, we really explore his story through season two um, and and how he came to operate this kind of monolithic uh, entity that would really go down in history as being one of the most notorious troubled teen organizations in the world. One of the things that you guys cover in in season two of Trapped in in Treatment is, I mean, we we all cringe when we see these, these PSAs, public service announcements on TV with dogs in cages, humans in cages, the abuse. The burnings, my God! I mean, you—you've got the guts to put this out there. Absolutely. I mean, for so long, these survivors weren't believed because you know these facilities would get ahead of the treatment, and wow. they would say, you know, your kid is going to say that they're being abused, that they're being sexually abused, that they're hurt, you know, by being restrained by staff members, but they're lying, they're manipulating just to get out of these programs. And I think we're at a place now, finally, thank God, that people are are hearing these stories and they're absolutely believing them. And so, you know. When we go through instances of children being held in dog cages or not being Mm. able to speak, being held in solitary confinement, you know, away from their families for years, these stories are true. And Robert Litchfield set out to create, in, in their own family words, the McDonald's of teen treatment. This is a for profit industry with a franchise model that was really aiming to, you know, get parents in at their most vulnerable state and keep kids in their care as long as humanly possible. You, you, you're stirring up so many memories because, I mean, when, when there, I was in, in, in a place where if, if I made a mistake, I had to go sit in the corner holding a brick above my head. And, and, and the pain that you go through, you don't forget anything like that. And, and you're trying to figure out how, how do I become perfect? And I mean, did you go through that as well? It's like, I, how, how do I make myself good again? Yeah, absolutely. I was actually just speaking with another survivor the other day um, about this exact thing, because when you are held to that level of structure and discipline 24 hours a day, ultimately it creates this kind of um, uh, psychological effect where you feel like you're always being watched. You're always doing something wrong. You're always, and, and of course, you know, none of that's true. Uh, at the program that I was at, the Academy at Ivy Ridge, you know, we would get in trouble if we accidentally knocked our water bottle yep, over yep. or if we are, if our shoulder touched the wall as we were walking by. So I just want to emphasize that these are not, this is not bad behavior. This is just structure to um, an insane degree. But I think you bring up such an important point, too, because, you know, what is the goal of sending a kid into these programs? We know that there is strict behavior modification that's happening. And so they're trying to get these children to comply. And that's the only way to get out of these programs. But if a child is 
entering one of these facilities due to a mental health crisis or due to a behavior that, you know, the parents deem inappropriate, we really should be asking, what is the root cause of that? Why is a child exhibiting this behavior? But instead, when they enter these programs, it's all about kind of slapping a Band-Aid on that behavior instead of getting to that root cause. And so we'd really love to switch that model in a sense of focusing on the actual care and mental health needs of the children instead of focusing on behavior modification as the route to kind of seeming fixed. But on the inside, we know that kids are leaving these facilities worse than when they went in. Isn't it odd that we have to go through such bad experiences personally before we can go out and become better listeners to a community that needs our help? Yeah, I mean, these survivors have really been telling their stories for decades. And I remember when when I first got out of the program and I would tell people what happened to me, I the, the response was always the same. And people would kind of chuckle and they'd go, so you were a bad kid, weren't you? Oh, my God. Were you bad? Were you rebellious? Mm. Were you... And, and and there's so much more to my story that, that people didn't know. And, and that's really what we see with a lot of these survivors, especially kids now who are entering these facilities for no other reason than maybe they had a parent die and they entered the child welfare system. Um, or maybe they have a learning disability and, and they were sent through the special education system. Yep. Yep. A lot of these teens, are they talking themselves into the darkness? Because they, they it just seems like that it's like. You know, when, when you hear the story, you're going, how, who, what, where, why, when and how? And then, and then you find out they're going into an institution. You're going, OK, now we've got more questions, but nobody wants to give you answers. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these stories are shocking by nature. You hear them and you're like, wait a second, how yes. could that happen? And no one was arrested. How could that happen? And and people just got away with it or there were adults who were doing it to these kids. I mean, it's hard to believe. Uh, but I think, you know, in today's world, it's like there's so much stuff that happens that's hard to believe that um, it, it actually, you know, really kind of starts to make sense as to, you know, there's just so much money involved in these facilities and they have so much power locally. Uh, where, wherever they are, usually in small rural areas uh, where they bring in a lot of money, they're able to make political contributions yep. uh, and, and they have a lot of social clout. And so, you know, no one's going to want to believe um, that those same people are responsible for these horrific things that are being done to kids. How do you think the game is going to change now that two parents are going to prison because their son shot up a school. I think that when you look into the stories that you've got on trapped in in treatment, that those parents need to be held accountable as well. We do hope that, you know, parents are held accountable if they're knowingly placing kids in facilities where abuse is happening. But we also hope that the facilities are held accountable, too. You know, they are licensed and accredited by their state to provide treatment for children. And there's been far too many stories and investigations that have happened into, you know, shedding light on the fact that these facilities are keeping kids longer than medically necessary, that they're billing for services that aren't even needed for these kids, um, that they're giving these children diagnoses that they don't have. I mean, at one program in Utah, they're basically blanket diagnosing all of these different children so that they can medicate them, so that they can bill their insurance and so forth. And so, you know, it really is very, very fraudulent and states and facilities should be held accountable. If you're placing kids from the child welfare system through the juvenile justice system or children with disabilities in these facilities, I want the world to know that, you know, taxpayer dollars are going to this treatment. Um, And given that's the case, we need to make sure that these facilities, if they're saying that they're providing treatment, that they're held accountable to doing so. And so, you know, stories like Trapped in Treatment help us to digest what the troubled teen industry is, to really, you know, highlight the fraudulent and opaqueness of the industry. And then with these stories, you know, we then go to legislators and policymakers and those, you know, stakeholders at the table within state government and within the licensing bodies to show them what we've found and, and hope that they will take, you know, the necessary and appropriate action. 
Yeah, I was just going to add something to that really quickly. So to um, give kind of a preview of some of the stories that you're going to hear in season two of Trapped in Treatment, um, at one point, WASP owned uh, or was contracted with this hospital called Brightway Adolescent Hospital. Mm -hmm. And they uh, ended up being investigated by the state. And it was reported that they found these documents where it was just a form template letter where every single child was diagnosed with the same thing every single child was then referred on to one of wasps programs so brightway became kind of this um uh intake center to pipeline these kids then into facilities that were overseas so they would take them from this uh facility in utah and send them to places like samoa or places like jamaica and so they had really operationalized uh this business model and so kind of just speaking to those blanket diagnoses that's very much uh, a, a tenant of what we address it here in season two. Oh my god you just triggered me because when you when kids are forced to travel that's human trafficking that's that's a whole completely different thing here it absolutely is and it's actually something that we will you know begin to investigate at the end of this season and i think you're going to see a lot more of us you know in relation to that but we are aware that there are facilities over international borders as Mm. well You know, Paris and myself, we were just in Jamaica dealing with a child abuse case um, related to a facility called Atlantis Leadership Academy that was housing seven American boys in Jamaica until they turned 18. And so there absolutely is aspects of human trafficking um, as it relates to this industry, because you're taking children across state borders, across international borders, where they're being forced to, you know, perform labor on behalf of these facilities. And these children deserve treatment. They deserve an education. And unfortunately, because these are, you know, for-profit lockdown type facilities, the world really doesn't know what's happening behind closed doors unless facility owners, former employees or students are willing to come out and, and talk about the abuse that they experience. So, you know, it really can go on for such a long time. But I do feel like we're really at a reckoning within, you know, the nation right now where these stories are being heard, they're being listened to, mm-hmm. and folks feel, you know, a lot more confidence to share their stories with their community and with the world on social media, as well as obviously with their lawmakers, like I've said previously. So I don't think the facilities are going to be able to get away with this, but, you know, it shouldn't take a death at a facility like it took at trails in North Carolina to shut a facility down. There should be a lot more standards in place so that we don't have to get to a place where we're only taking action if there has been a death. You know, you talk about placing uh, uh, teens inside these institutions. My granddaughter volunteered volunteered to go in and and they said just three days three days became one week became two weeks i was freaking out i i because in listening to season number one i'm going no no this has got to move we've we've got to get her out of there as soon as possible yeah, it's it, even in my story, um, which we also showcase in this season, and my, my mom shares her story for for the very first time from her perspective, uh, which is really interesting. But you know, I was excited to go. Oh, I see? thought I was going to. I thought I was going to a boarding school that was going to be like college. I was going to make friends. Yeah. We were going to have slumber parties and paint each other's nails. And I also knew that our family needed help at that time. And so it was absolutely jarring to walk into a facility that was more like a quasi kid prison than it was any kind of a, a treatment center. And, you know, they really um, exploited my mom. I, I stayed there for two and a half years, not because I needed it, but because they knew that my mom would pay for it. Oh my God. And that's the real reality of what we're seeing here. Well, I love where your heart is. I'm glad that you continue to push forward with this because we've got to get it into the conversations. That's the only way we're going to make changes. you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. So I expect to talk to you in season three. We absolutely will come back. And and thank you so much for sharing parts of your story, too. It, it matters so much when there's just, you know, different touch points about different experiences and how, you know, this industry is really, really relatable. It is. Please be brilliant today. We'll do our best. <laughs> thank you for having us.